this in time, but it hasn't been an issue since I've been there and really takes a lot of my place. So I want to thank him for that. And second, I want to thank you, Anne, for allowing me back. I think I spoke so long at the first time I did a speaking engagement, um, they stood up and clapped because I was done talking. So hopefully tonight I don't do the same thing. Uh, I think we're going to start with the video. And the reason we're showing the video is it's very tough to talk about myself, and uh, sometimes it's just better to see it. I could tell you my story uh, from when I started, like you guys sitting in, in these meetings and, and seminars, clinics, and learning, and um, you know, starting my, my role as a teacher. I initially was going to be a dentist. I came to Fresno State. I was pre-dental and took all the classes. And then uh, my friend, uh, Angel Arroyo, is your angel? That's a guy who I thank every time I look at my paycheck, I say, thank you, Angel, appreciate that. <laughs> because I was supposed to be a dentist. And uh, he said, hey, they're looking for a coach. You know, you should come out here. And I said, I'll be right there, man. That's $400, that's awesome. So I started coaching and within one to two years, I came home and told my family, uh, I don't think I wanna be a dentist anymore. I think I wanna coach football. And it was a very tough decision because everything had been set up. I'd been going to school for it. I'd been going to orientations. I had taken the DAT, I had gone to UCSF for their uh, you know, spring orientations and got to meet people but I basically changed and made a hard right on my career path. And after that hard right, I have not looked back. I've had uh, some of the greatest moments and stories. Uh, you, couldn't, you couldn't put it in a book. Some of it, unfortunately, you can't really say because uh, you know a lot of these kids that you deal with, I mean, their stories are unbelievable. And it's, you know, I like to keep it private among themselves, but some of the greatest moments I've had is just people don't even know, you know, the, the things on the sidelines. The letters that people say, I get phone calls from kids that I coached years ago. I had a kid start a donor drive in Reedley, and you know, when you wonder if you're making a difference and you see these people coming out of the woodwork, uh, you'll know, and that, that's your payment, you know, and that's where you, where you see what you've invested come to fruition. So we're gonna start this video for a few minutes and I'll come back and talk to you guys a little bit. I wanna give you two things. I wanna give you a little something that I think you could learn as you go through education because education is changing. It's a different game than when I started. And then secondly, I want to talk about standing for more and tie it into the power of you because um, I've had a last three years, some people could say it would be the most difficult three years, but in my opinion, I've had probably the greatest three years of my life, the last three years, and that's not making anything up and that's not being cheesy, but I will tell you a little bit about that and how it came to life and how some people in my life have come back. So uh, let's go ahead and start the video and then I can talk a little bit more uh, after. The thing that you learn in the coaching community is that all these guys that you spend time working with, working against, being on the same staff, being on different staff, it's like a fraternity, it's a group of brotherhood. And um, I don't know what your teaching paths are gonna, where they're gonna take you, but for me, I've taught in three different school districts and at different schools, and you just never know really where you're gonna end up. So I wanted to give you a couple tips where you guys are starting at, and then like I said, I'll talk a little bit about my story, but one of the things is, is just being so good that you can't be ignored. Um, for example, I started uh, the internship here. I think I was the first cohort group that, uh, that Fresno State offered to the Krem School of Ed. And I was with a group of people and, and I got my job at Central High because they were basically the only school that was gonna pay me to do an internship. So that's how I started. And I started in 1999. I was 24 years old, very young, and I didn't really know what to do. But I had this passion for teaching and that passion allowed me to learn more, become better. And that passion is really what gets you through the tough times in teaching or in coaching. What they did not tell you on that show is I'm 0-3 right now, so I'm not a good coach anymore. Um, sometimes that happens, and you're not going to always be on top, and you're not going to always have things go your way. So if you're not passionate about teaching, the phone calls from the parents are going to bug you. The kids that don't want to be there are going to bug you. All the little things are going to drive you nuts if you don't have passion. If you have passion, it's infectious. All those problems will gravitate towards you and they'll get in line and they'll follow you almost like on your path. It's almost like being a leader. You know, in my experience in teaching, I, I love the rough kids. I love the kids that get in trouble. Those guys you give in my class, I love it. I get them going. But they're drawn to your passion. They're drawn to your energy. If you don't bring your energy each and every day, in case somebody else is, and they're gonna gravitate to them, whether it be a friend, whether it be a peer, okay, whether it be a negative influence, okay, good or bad energy, you got to draw them. So be so good that they can't ignore you. I uh, started out as an assistant coach at Central. Well, I started out before Central, but 
My first teaching job and coaching was at Central for a few years. And then I said, I want to be a head coach. That looks really cool. I think, you know, being a head coach would be this, that. And it looked just like a very romantic job. You know, you get to do your own things, make your own decisions. So I went to Reedley High. They were the first school to uh, give me a job. I had interviewed at Sunnyside High School. And even though I felt like I was qualified, I didn't get the job. So I was devastated. I had to stay another year at Central and I, for the Reedley job, and I got it. And this thing that I thought was really cool ended up being really hard and not so cool. So I went one and nine my first year at Reedley High. And I was the worst coach I've seen. And I think I had one of the worst teams I've seen in a while as well. And that was me. And that was something that I was passionate about. I said, how can something I love so much I be so bad about? So then you have to evaluate yourself. You got to get feedback. Okay, every test you give your kids, you're going to get feedback whether you're a good teacher or not. You can blame your kids, but you're either, there's a saying in football, you're either coaching it or you're allowing it to happen. You're either coaching it or you're allowing it to happen. The same with teaching. So we're, we're blessed that you're in a, in a line of work where you get instant feedback every day. So the feedback I got from my first year that I, that I wasn't doing so good. So I had to find a way to get better. So basically, I would call every coach that I thought was successful and ask them to have breakfast, ask them to have lunch, just learn, just get information, just get this big ball of knowledge that would help me um, in my situation. I would even sleep on the floors of college coaches. I went to Cal Berkeley one time and I just showed up and I said, I just want to learn. And the guy said, you didn't come with anybody? I said, nope. He goes, who do you know here? I said, I don't know anybody. I just want to learn what you guys are doing here and can I watch practice? And he was uh, so excited that a guy just drove up to do that and he ended up being a, he used to be a high school coach himself. I slept on his floor for about two to three days and got to watch Cal Berkeley's spring football and sit in all their meetings and get to meet all the coaches. But it was one of those things about, you know, being so good, you can't be ignored. You got to go out there and you got to reach out. You got to put yourself in a position. So all that passion, I kind of had an idea and I came up with a philosophy and a plan and we started implementing that plan at Reedley. And we had success. We had more success than they had in the previous 30 years. And, and we had a lot of first time things, playoff games and, and all that stuff. And it was really a great time. Um, you know, you don't know how things work out, but I didn't get the Sunnyside job. And maybe it was a blessing because when I was at Reed the High School, I met my wife, which is, you know, life changing. I, I had my life before I was married and then I have my life after I was married. And um, one of the things that when you're a single guy is you could watch film every day and you could do football and you could do it nonstop and, you know, you could eat out every night. And so I had a different, a little bit different lifestyle being a head coach and a single guy. Um, I met my wife on my first and only blind date. Um, the superintendent from Kings Canyon Unified called me and he said, hey, I want to talk to you about something that I'm not real comfortable talking about. And I had just gone one and nine. I'm thinking I'm going to get fired in the middle of the summer. <laughs> so I said, sure. What do you want to talk about? He says like, well, we're having this dinner for my wife and my wife and my daughter. Uh, she's around your age. She's a little younger. She's coming into town. She needs a date. And we, I want to know if you would like to come. And I said, for sure. I thought I wasn't going to get fired. So I was there. So anyways, uh, I met my wife. Uh, we had a great time. And, and since that day, I haven't looked back. And now we've been married uh, seven years with one kid and, and another on the way. But that was a blessing. And I, I always thought to myself, I didn't get the sunny side job, but maybe there was a reason why I didn't get it. And, and it was that really high job. That really high job, I met some great kids and people in the community. I ended up living there for a few years, but it was a five-year deal. And then at some point, we're having success every year, but it wasn't enough. And I thought to myself, um, is it me? Am I just average? Or if I go somewhere else, will I have more success? I was just very curious. So the sunny side job opened up again, the job that they didn't give me five or six years earlier. So I applied for the job and I ended up getting it, which was great. And once I got it, I realized that it wasn't all it was cracked up to be. There was a lot of obstacles and it was a really big school and there was a lot of good things going about it, but the school had no spirit and the kids really had no structure and it was going to take a lot. So I went to Sunnyside High School and I got some friends to coach with me and was teaching biology there and uh, we started out 0-3 with some good players, but we just seemed to be underachieving. And then at some point, the kids all bought in and the discipline and it was very hard. I want to really make things clear to you that if you want to be successful in education, things are really hard. They're not very easy. Uh, like I said, right now, we're starting out the season 0-3 and I haven't had a losing record and knock on wood for years, but 
if you just relax for a little bit or you're not doing that above and beyond. So um, it was very hard at Sunnyside. But once we got things rolling and we got the student body there and, and we got people going, we ended up winning eight games in a row and you know, won the most games in school history and won the school's first playoff game. And it was just a great feeling. And sometimes we get tied up in the wins and losses and what we're doing there. But one thing that was a great moment for me is Sunnyside High School had been uh, around for about 10 to 12 years and they didn't have a fight song. So I'm going to school and we're trying to talk about school pride and they said, well, we don't have a fight song. So I said, what, we don't have a fight song? No, we don't have a fight song. So we made a contest and I think we gave $100 I, what are the, I cards or iPad certificates or whatever. So for the kid who can, uh, yeah, so the kid who can write a fight song. So a couple kids wrote a fight song, the band put it to music and they would play it and they'd start singing it and the kids were all singing it. So one of our games, we walk in and we had just lost to, to Edison, which is a very good program and it was for a chance to win the league in my second year. And I walk out and I'm kind of frustrated and then one of my coaches goes, hey, you gotta just stop and take a look. As we turned around, the whole stadium for Sunnyside High School was full and the kids were, or the kids were singing the fight song, even after a loss. They were so excited to be there that they had actually sold out for the first time in school history, the home side stands, and they were singing the fight songs. And it just made me take a step and say, wow, that was, I was part of that. I was part of that. And that's a beautiful thing about coaching is you get to be part of all this. It's the kids making the plays. It's the kids doing all that. It really is about the kid, but you're along for the ride. And the ride that I've been along has been just a great ride. And then uh, after Sunnyside, we had great success there. Uh, the Central job opened up and I had, gone, I had taught for Central years and I had a lot of friends there. And uh, in terms of football for us, Central is it's, it's at the top. Uh, there's a handful of schools that are at the top and Central is one of them. And I thought this is a place where I wanna end up coaching the rest of my career. And it's really as high as you're gonna go in high school football. So I went to Central High School and took the job. And the, again, when I got there, the culture was different. The culture was very different because organizations are made of systems, people, and culture. So to improve your organization, you gotta constantly bring in new people, you gotta constantly improve systems, and then culture takes time. So the culture was very different there, and we had some, uh, we were winning, but we had some uh, rough patches. For example, we were undefeated, and we were playing the number two team in the Valley, and it was a big game, and we actually got blown out so bad that they had a running clock. That's like the mercy rule in football. And I hadn't had one of those either at the other schools I'd been at, but I had one at Central with the most talented kids. So something, the light bulb went off. It said we had all this talent, but we're, we're not playing as, as good as we could. So after that tough loss, our kids bore down. I have Jay right here is one of our kids. And we put together, put together a run to win so many games and make it to the Valley Finals, which is the first time in, since 1992 in school history. And we won 11 games. Uh, which is also a school record. Central has been playing football for about 90 years and they've never won that many games. So it was a, just a really, really great ride and I was just blessed to be a part of it, okay? And the reason I'm telling you this story is because this all took a long time. I mean, it started for me being at Kerman and all these small schools and you just have to be investing in your craft, learning, getting better, failing. Fail, fail, fail. You're gonna fail forward a bunch. And, and that's the part that a lot of people don't wanna do. They don't want, they wanna be comfortable. And you gotta be uncomfortable being comfortable, especially as a teacher. When I see good teachers teach, it's a thing of beauty. It doesn't matter what the subject is, whether it's uh, English, PE, I admire a good teacher. And I'm at the point in my career where, to me, that matters most. Teaching and reaching out to kids and I want to really appreciate it, and I, and I can learn. I've been doing this for 15, 16 years, and I still learn from guys that are younger than me. Because some people have been, live, they've been teaching for 20 years, but they've been on year one for 20 years. Okay, you're going to be teaching with people like that. They've been teaching for 20 years, and they're still on year one. Okay, every year it's up to you to stretch yourself, to grow, to learn more, to challenge, to try to, new, try to do new things in order to become a better teacher. So that's my little bit of advice as you come through. I've been battling cancer since the Sunnyside story, so this has been about three or four years. And finally, on the last doctor appointment at Stanford, uh, I got some really bad news. And I knew, I knew what the news was gonna be. When you have cancer, there's certain 
side effects and there's certain, um, I don't know, there's certain telltale signs that something's going on. And after one of our great seasons at Central, I had been regressing and feeling more tired and feeling worse and having some symptoms that weren't good. So I, I had a real tough time uh, knowing what was going on. I told my wife about two or three months before we actually went to the doctor that I think it's back and, um, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit scared. And so she ended up being a little bit nervous and we went to the doctor and the doctor, uh, you know, agreed that the cancer was coming back. And I looked at my options and one of them was to have a bone marrow uh, donor. So we asked them questions and they said, well, you know, there's a very good chance you're going to find a match, but people of your ethnicity don't really join the bone marrow registry. And I looked at the numbers and, you know, she said about 10% of Hispanics are in the registry when, you know, in the Valley we have about 35 to 40% Hispanics. So you're going to have a little bit of a tougher time finding uh, a match. And I thought to myself, wow, what, what a bad thing to hear for someone who's out of options. So I thought to myself, well, I think I want to do something about this. So I thought, well, I'm coaching high school football and I've been able to meet some people and I have a platform to speak of. I'm going to say something and get a couple people out to join the registry. And I re initially thought I could get like 100 people. That would be really cool. So I talked to our school district and said, hey, can I do a donor drive on our first game? And they said, absolutely. So I started getting this donor drive. Um, I am not on social media, but I got on a Twitter and I started an account. And I started getting information out there just to let people know that we're going to do a donor drive. And then... Um, I got an email from a friend of mine who I went to high school with, uh, Tasha. Tasha, where are you at? Tasha's back there. So Tasha and I were, uh, we used to carpool to school together. We were pretty much neighbors uh, all growing up through junior high, through high school. And Tasha, Tasha sent me an email and said, hey, I would like to help, and I would ha like to help organize. And you get emotional through this thing, and when you're sick, I really don't get emotional too bad because I've been having to deal with this, but I sat on my computer and I started crying and I thought to myself, how could someone just go out of their way and do something like that for me? And it just blew my mind. So my secretary walked in and saw the football coach crying and then walked right back out. I said, <laughs> I said well, I'm sorry, he caught me at a bad, caught me at a bad time. But that just, it, 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 I couldn't believe it. So the first thing I learned is that when you guys do something and you have a greater purpose, people want to be part of it. People want to do something that is bigger than themselves. So we started this donor drive, and if you guys know me, I, I'm really detailed about football, and that's about it. And uh, Tasha took over this job and has done a great job, and we started with two or three other schools that wanted to jump on. Then it went to three and four. Then it went to a dozen. And now we probably are around 20 schools or organizations that have had a donor drive. We went on the radio, and we first started getting the word out about our first donor drive at uh, Central. And they asked, how many are you expecting? I said, well, I was going to say 100, but for some reason I said 1,000. So I said 1,000, and Tasha looked at me, you just said 1,000. <laughs> and I was reading a book at the time, and the book said that you have to do 10 times of what you want to do, so it just jumped out. <laughs> so we did 1,000. We said 1,000, and how the heck are you going to do 1,000? Well, after... 10 different cities, 12 different schools. Uh, last Friday, we hit 1,057 or something like that, and we had more last week. So we reached our goal, and I want to thank Tosh, if you could give her a round of applause for doing that. Okay. The second thing I want to talk about is attacking fear. It is scary, and it's, it's hard to say that something is wrong with you. So the first time I did my treatment, I did 12 doses of chemotherapy, and I just went to work and I never said anything. I lost my hair. Some people didn't even know. They're saying, hey, man, you're balding now. You said, yeah, I let it shave it all off. Yeah. Um, so I did my chemo and I was, I was over it and it wasn't a big deal. Okay. And I didn't say anything. And then the second time, I really didn't say much. I had missed a lot of school and I let my team know, but I didn't say anything because I was really afraid to tell people that, hey, something's wrong with me. Something's, I'm not all right. Um, so I had a tough time with that. And then finally, in that last doctor's appointment, I said, I'm going to put myself out there, which I don't normally like talking about myself and my health issues, but I did, and I attacked fear. So what I learned, the second thing I learned, is that you have to attack fear. If you just let fear sit around, it becomes more powerful, and it starts to control you. But if you attack fear and you get after it, 
You can then do the things that you're afraid to do over and over and over. I mean, I'm speaking here today. The last time I spoke at Fresno State, I bombed it. But you got to come back. You got to rally up. You know, you got to attack the fear and move on. So just getting the story out was very hard. And I learned that if you attack the fear, it becomes much more easy. And the third thing I want to talk about is just carrying your flag. So all the people that I invested in and all the friends and, and coaches and uh, the players that I spent time with, when, I, when they found out that this was going on, they actually were the ones who started the drives. Um, the Reedley coach and an ex-player started one, some friends from Sanger, some friends from Selma, and then people who aren't real close to you, but they, they admire you and they appreciate your integrity did. Liberty High School last night, we went to play a, a football game over there and they had a registry and we got 40-something people. So, like we talked about having a greater purpose, uh, people will actually carry your flag when you're down. And at some point in your teaching career, things are going to go bad, whether it's a, a divorce or you're having some, uh, you know, career issues. But the kids that you invest in and the people that you work with, if you do what you do with integrity, they're going to carry your flag and they're going to pick you, pick you up. Um, I've gotten text messages. I've gotten phone calls from people about being an inspiration. Uh, I've had people do projects. I've had, I mean, my friends that are here with the Stand For More shirts, uh, we all grew up in the early 90s, and we don't see each other that much anymore because we all have families, but they've been at every donor drive, and they've been up at 7 a.m. on a Saturday to do this because it's important. So when you talk about the power of you, and you talk about the power of uh, an idea, you know, a lot of time I think we set our goals too low. We make goals that we get, and then once we get them, that's it. So when you set your goals, set them high. Set them 10 times more than you think. Because guess what? If you, even if it's 10 times higher than you think, and you're only halfway, that's five times higher than you normally would have done it. Right? And you could walk away seeing that. So set your goals high, and then this, the people that you invest in, they're going to they're gonna carry your flag. And I'm blessed with my friends and family that I've had here. Um, just everything they've done, and this story's going. Um, we're hoping we're over 1,000 people joining the registry right now. And with Fresno State coming up this week and some of the other schools, I mean, who knows? We, this might be 2,000. Uh, it might get out. Our next goal, see, I set my phone because I like to talk a lot. So, um, Our next goal is to get it out now. So I'm going to ask you, since we have a lot of power, power, you know, people to power you, I'm going to ask you to get this story out. If you guys go to Twitter or our Facebook page, um, this is National you know, Leukemia and Lymphoma Awareness Month is get the story out. Get the leak. Because I think a lot of people just don't know about it. And I wanted to use my story to inspire people to do more. Because at some point in your life, if you join the registry and you are a match, you will be saving somebody's life. And it's not going to be just somebody. It's going to be somebody's husband, somebody's son, somebody's father. And they're going to be out of options. And talk about being the power of you and, and being a hero. Uh, you will go greatly appreciated and you will change someone's life forever. So please make sure that once you guys can, if you see us on social media, get the word out, spread it out. Our goal is to now get this out of the Fresno area and get it statewide and hopefully nationally and just get more people aware of a bone marrow registry.